for the cloud. Okay. Cool. So working with buyers, has anybody breezed through the training packet of working with buyers? Who has worked with buyers before? Yeah, different animal. You got your listings, then you have your buyers. Um, I was dealing with buyers this morning because the stress level was so high because we're in the negotiation part of the request for repairs. Um, they're not getting the response that they expected. And as soon as they respected, expected, so they're ultimately thinking, the sellers don't want to sell this home. They're absolutely unfair, yada, yada, yada. And really, it's just a lack of communication when you're working with buyers of setting the expectation up front. They thought that they were going to get a response within 24 hours. Their request was very large. They needed over the weekend to think about it. And ultimately, the expectation should have been that this week, coming week, is when we were going to be hashing this out. So if I would have set that expectation up front, we would not have had that conversation this morning. So working with buyers is making sure that the communication is there and the expectation is there um, right up in the get-go. What are we trying to accomplish when we write this offer? If we write it this way, this is the expectation that's going to happen. And walking them through the four negotiations that happen during the transaction. Um, so I'll walk you through what that means. But just because you negotiate your offer does not mean that your negotiating is over. There's a lot of things that have to happen during that escrow period if you get it accepted. You're going to negotiate the inspections of the property. You're going to negotiate the appraisal of the property. And then when it's all said and done, you're going to negotiate to make sure the close date is still on track and the closing of the property. So you have initial negotiation of the offer, inspections, appraisal, and closing. All of that has to happen in order to get a successful close. So if you're setting the expectation that uh, once, we get this once we get this offer accepted, we're smooth sailing from here on out, then it's going to be a very difficult escrow because in their head, why is this so difficult? Why are these things coming up? What the heck is going on? What does it mean that contingencies are coming up? I thought this. Why is the lender asking for this? You're at the last part of your closing, and all of a sudden you have your last little hurdle that you jump through. Um, I have to talk to you after this about, I got an email at lunch right now. Okay. So there's always going to be hurdles through it. Now, the communication that he's had with his client from start to finish has been awesome. So his client might not be putting a lot of pressure on him. I don't know if I'm overstepping my boundaries. Not at all. Not at all. So his client is very well educated through the whole process, so there's no stress on him which means there's no stress on Noah. The goal is to keep the stress minimal on your client, make your life awesome. The moment their stress rises and you can't get it out of control, you've lost control of the transaction, and now they're running the show, and you're playing catch up trying to get them back under control and bring their stress level down. The meeting this morning with my clients, or with one of the agent's clients was, to get the stress level back down. That's all it was about. They wanted to rant and rave about how everything has transpired, how the sellers are jerks, how no one is responding to their request. At the end of the day, my goal was just, let's take a breath. My, my voice was low. No matter how heated they got, I didn't debate, I didn't argue, I agreed, and I just said, and they go, well, what do we do at this point? Right now, let's take a breath. Just calm down, let's relax. Nothing happens in real estate overnight. So these aren't your clients. These are agents. another agent's clients that we're, we're working together now to basically close out the transaction. I need to get control again to set the expectation of from here going forward, this is what's going to happen. Uh, so working with buyers, advantages and disadvantages. A courtesy checklist is awesome. Um, Think about safety items. So we'll go through this part. Okay, we're getting down. Objection. Obviously, Buyers are awesome. Most agents always start with buyers. Buyers are always going to be a part of your business. The goal is to become a listing agent. When you become a listing agent, buyers come to you. If you're just working with buyers all the time, you're going to be chasing the transaction. You know, buyers will contact you, but once that transaction's over, a buyer will either give you referrals or not, but after that, there's no more business. If you have a listing, you have a sign up, you got buyers calling you about that property and therefore you're getting more re return business for listings. 
but as a as an agent that likes to work with people um you know your weekends you're good with that you don't want to deal with the stress of selling a home you want to just find that perfect home form buyers are awesome that way you do have to be an expert in the market as far as what is inventory in the market if you're going to work with buyers buyers expect that you know inventory and the advantage to you is do you know inventory before anybody else do you go to your MLS meetings to learn about what's coming soon to work with buyers? That's what they're looking for as a good buyer's agent. Um, uh, you do make quicker money because when you qualify a buyer, they're ready to buy. If you're working with a buyer ready to buy, you're looking at a paycheck within 30 to 60 days. You know, you, you just need to find them the house and boom, you can do it. If the house isn't available, now you're turning into a listing agent too, because you're going to go find that house to then put the people together. Um, you're, you're, you're laughing, but that's, that's right. Is that you're out in the world doing that? Um, okay, a courtesy checklist. So, how do you work with buyers? You're on the phone with them. You have to build a rapport, you have to build a trust. You cannot just fit everything out to them when they call in and say, oh, I want to know about this property. What's the price on the property? You still need to try to convert that lead to qualifying the buyer. If you instantly give them the price of the property, they're going to say, thank you so much, hang up, and now it's a dead lead. So the goal is to try to ask, well, um, while I'm looking the price up for this property, what is it that you're looking for? Oh, let me jump on my computer. I'll be happy to answer that question. While I'm looking for the price of the property, what is it that you're looking for? What area are you looking in? What price range are you looking in? Oh, wonderful. What made you decide on that area? Oh, do you have kids? Are you moving because of the school district? All you're doing is probing to try to find qualifying questions. You're trying to get information. And while you're trying to get information, they're learning your personality and you're building that rapport. Um, the moment you give them what you want, the conversation's over. So you've got to find a way to kind of slow down on, oh, let me jump on the computer and get that information for you right now. And it's because you have them on the phone, you can take 30 seconds to kind of qualify them. Uh, the goal would be appointment setting. You have to get them in front of you as soon as possible. The moment you can get them in front of you, you have that instant report. You're either going to nail it or you're not. You're either going to click or they're going to say, nope, not you. Um, Noah, every time I'm looking at him, I keep bringing this up. A buyer calls and says, I'd like to meet with you. Why don't you go buy me lunch? And we can meet. <laughs> uh, breakfast. Yeah. Breakfast. Um, how he handled it was great. Actually, go for how it. How did you handle it, Noah? <laughs> I'd be more than happy to take you to get a cup of coffee. If you'd like to meet and sit down, I'll bring my laptop and pull some stuff up. Yeah, I'm not your servant. Like I'm not here to. to I also got asked you. in that that same um, situation when I met them that if I would pay my commission towards their closing costs, <laughs> say, um, say like all a, like of these two or three thousand dollar commission. Yeah, all of these questions are very valid. I'd love to talk with you. Why don't we set an appointment so we can sit down and discuss our my strategies for getting you into your home. If you try to rebuttal or debate over the phone, you lost. It's done. Well, they're going to hang out and be like, that's not the answer I was looking for. I'm out. So it's, you know, good question. Appreciate the question. I love the, the back and forth of this. Why don't we set up an appointment so we can continue this? Because once we get this out of the way, let me explain to you what I'm going to do to help you find your dream home. That's putting value back on what you do. You don't even try to explain that over the phone. You're just trying to book the appointment. Get them either in the house, get them a meeting at their house. If you set the appointment here at the office, you're in your, your park. You know, it's in your realm. If you go to their house, they're going to be in control of the conversation. So that means you better have a very strong presence to take over that conversation because you're in their world. If you bring them to your world, this is, you know, you're in control right out of the gate. So just know where you set the appointment matters. Um, you need to make sure when you meet with them, you're disclosing what an agency relationship is. Um, I am a firm believer in the buyer agreement form. I know everybody has different feels for it. At the end of the day, when you feel that you've built a rapport, 
that's when you're hitting them with the buyer agreement form. I can't tell you when that is in the transaction, but you will know that when you have a rapport built with this agent and they say, yes, I want to hire you, or I am comfortable with you working for me, it's a very simple transition. You can either do it hard where you're like, sign this form or else I'm not doing nothing, or wonderful, I'm happy to represent you. In order for me to legally represent you, I need you to fill out this agency relationship. I need you to understand what the agency relationship is and to understand that if I'm going to negotiate, I'm negotiating on behalf of you. That's what this agreement is talking about. You're hiring me to negotiate on the behalf of you, on, on behalf of you. When I'm out in the world, I can honestly say that you're a client. By you signing this form, I can also talk to you about things that are coming soon on the market in our company. Because if we have exclusive listings, I can't talk to you about those exclusive listings unless I get clear direction that this is a marketable property to the general public. If you're a part of our organization, you are considered within our organization, and I can talk within our organization. These are all just little tips of how to get the buyer agreement form. I'll tell you story after story of agents I get burned. And the more that I preach this, and the more that I talk to agents about this, the less I have for sympathy when I go, you knew, you knew you didn't have a buyer agreement form. You don't have a client, you have a prospect. You have a lead, you have a relationship. But at the end of the day, everything in real estate needs to be in writing. And it's a very, very, um, Noah tried to go for one. The lady pushed back, the one that wanted free lunch or free breakfast, she pushed back. Well, we found out very clear why. She has a friend in the business that has their license too. The mom wants to hire this person. The daughter wants to hire Noah. Well, I'm, I feel more, I, I'm glad that Noah found that out in the beginning because ultimately he could be spinning his wheels, working for this person, running around to come to find out he's going to do all the legwork and that person's going to get the offer. I still spend now, about 15, spends, 20 minutes a week looking but at But he stuff knows what his time is worth. He knows what his time is worth with that person. And the more they start pushing on him, the more he can push back and say, we have this discussion. Are you hiring me or you're not hiring me? What I'm doing for you right now is just, I'd love to stay in touch. I want to keep you on. It's not that he's not going to work for her. He just knows that he's not going to go above and beyond and literally, unless he chooses to, he knows what his competition is. And he knows that because he, he had that conversation up front. He wasn't able to give it, but he's still doing his job by trying to get them as clients. He didn't stop that. That makes sense. Cool. Uh, to be fair, it was the mom who asked me to buy the breakfast and the mom who asked me to donate my commission. Yeah, the mom's was the daughter. The daughter's the one who wants to hire me, the mom's not. So he knows that he's got to win the mom over if he wants to get this client. <laughs> yeah. Who's got the money? <laughs> um, mom's co signing. Try to learn as much as you can about the buyers and their wants and needs. The more you, you probe, so I want to buy a house. Wonderful. Why? Uh, because our, our kids are moving out and we want to downsize. Okay, so you're retiring. Are you retiring? No, I'm not retiring. We're still working in the area. Okay, would you want to move over to, you know, do you want to commute? Um, when you say downsize, do you need to sell a home? Um, do you want to have a room for your kids if they come back and visit? Uh, how soon do you want to move? So there's scripts on the back end that just constantly are objection and probing scripts. Um, YouTube videos are great. Jump online, like how to work with buyers and listen to other agents on what they do. Ultimately, try to write out a list of questions that you, as a general topic for every buyer and practice those questions and get it becoming muscle memory that if I ask this question, this is a leading to the next question. If they respond this way, I'm gonna lead with that question. A lot of this business is muscle memory. Um, here's the do's and don'ts in real estate that you should remember when showing property. So you're working with buyers. Um, oh, disclose significant things. So you need to know neighborhoods. So if you're in a neighborhood and you're trying to work a buyer in that neighborhood, learn a couple good facts about that neighborhood that you can lean on, especially if it has an association. Take the time to call the property manager that handles the association because that's going to, that's going to help for all those properties in there. Just, oh yeah, the association manager is, you know, penny over it, that's manually. Just having that little knowledge makes you sound more as an expert in that territory. 
So, oh yeah, you know, Grover Beach City is planning on doing roads in 2019 in this neighborhood. Wow, that person is so on. It's like that one little piece of information. It's almost like when you leave in the morning, try to learn something new about the city's doing. Um, those little word booklets that are like spinners, you learn new words, it's the same concept. Like learn something new about the city or the territory or real estate and then go out and use that as your, as your knowledge for that day. And, and just makes you look like more of an area specialist. Do's and don'ts. So now you have your buyer, you're working with your buyer, your buyer goes, hey, I want you to go show me this property. Walk up to the house. Um, ultimately, my goal is always to set up one appointment before I really put pressure on like talking about the buyer agreement form. I, I, it usually takes me one, maybe two times at most to build the rapport to where I feel confident that, so we're, let's talk business. Let's, let's come back to my office, let's sit down, let's figure out a plan of, of what we're looking for now. I don't take my buyer agreement form and try to push it the very first day when I'm meeting them. I need to build the rapport. And it typically is phone calls to build up for the appointment at the property or the appointment in the office. And even if I have the appointment in the office, we're setting up our day to go out and look at property. Um, once we look at those properties, we're coming back and then it's a uh, great, I'll follow up with you again. And on the second appointment is when I'm pushing like, okay, you know, we're about to go three hours to go look at property. Let's meet at the office first. There's some paperwork that needs to be handled before we go out. And they go, oh, you know, when they show up, I don't even tell them what it is. They just show up and then I take 15 minutes to go, these are the properties we're going to look at. And as your representative, this is actually the, the paperwork I wanted to talk to you about also before we go hand it, go look. And if they sign it there, Great. If they don't, at least we had it up front. Then throughout the whole day, I'm talking to them about the services that I offer. So by the end of the day, wonderful. Now that I've shown you three hours worth of property, you have any, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to hire me today? No, I, I think you're great. Wonderful. So in order to move forward from here on out, you know, I need to get this signed and then I can start setting you up on my systems that I've been talking to you about for three hours. You know, I've just filled their head with what I do to, you know, oh, I I love going to the MLS. You know, I talk at the MLS all day long. And yeah, I got this system where it emails me properties and I network with all these agents. And oh my God, I'm thinking of a property right now that's coming soon. Um, man, I'd love to talk to you about it, but they haven't hired me yet. You know, <laughs> holding it back. Um, so now you go to show up at the property. First things first, you pull the MLS, you look at the properties that are there. You have your vacant properties, those are your buffers. Okay. So you do a radius of, okay, they're looking for three bedrooms, two baths, and a pomo. You pull your properties and you kind of map out a, a plan. And you're going to leave yourself a 15-minute window for, for drive time from one property to the next. Figure your showings are going to go from 15 to 25 minutes. So you go to property A, it's, it's a 20-minute showing, and then a 10, 15-minute buffer to get the next property, if the drive time allows it. And you want to map out yourself where you're going. Map out your occupied first. So I like to print the MLS. I map them out. I tentatively, on top of the MLS sheet, I'll write, okay, I want to try for a 1 o'clock on this one, a 1.30 on this one, a 2 o'clock on this one. Then I have my vacants as my buffer. Then I call the homeowner or the agent, and I say, hey, I'm trying to set up a showing for 1 o'clock here. Can I, can I do that? And I call the other one, I'm trying to do 1.30 here, 2 o'clock here. Now I got my map. They call back. They're like, nah, you can do a 2 o'clock here. Oh, shoot. Okay, I'm going to move things around. Ultimately, you have your game plan. Now you throw your vacants in there. And you go, all right, I'm going to show this one at 1 o'clock. If the showing goes well and it pushes till 1.30, then we're going to jump right over to my 1.30. If that showing goes really crap, then we're going to jump back to a vacant because i got a buffer because my next showing is not till 2 o'clock. So my, my buffer vacant ones are not on the schedule as far as I don't care when I show them. Ultimately, I can show them as a wraparound when I come back to come back to the office, as long as they get shown. So those are your, you better go with the flow. You know, just, and it doesn't need to be, um, don't be overwhelmed like, oh, we have to get to that one next because it's vacant. If it's vacant, you just, you move with it. And uh, if it has to be the last one you show, then you kind of rewrap back over. But you gotta make that judgment call at the moment. Um, <clears throat> if it's an occupied property, it is very courteous to leave your business card. If you were like, man, I just ordered these business cards, 50 bucks, and I keep dropping them off, print some, 
make copies of them. Go down to Office Max, get the crappy paper, print some. If you if you don't want to leave your nice business cards because you spent a hundred dollars and you got a thousand of them, you don't want to give them away. Find something else, but leave your business card. Uh, at the end of the day, it's more for the agent to be courteous on a follow up. Uh, if you really want to build an amazing reputation and have an awesome relationship with the affiliates and the other professionals in the industry, and you want to find that your business will go very smooth when you're negotiating, don't wait for them to ask how the showing went. Your client walks to the car and you're going to say, hey, I'm going to lock up this property. And you do a quick text message. Hey, appreciate the showing. Have a template in there. Appreciate the showing. My client really liked blank and disliked blank. Don't be scared to give them negative feedback. Be truthful. <coughs> do it right there on the spot. If you get it done, make it part of your habit. I showed the property. Ah, uh, we walked up. Literally, if it's a, if the client walks up and they're like, don't even waste your time. Um, um, I put my clients on a one to ten. So before we even go look at the first property, I say one, totally waste of time. Ten, you love the property. And I say, I want you to walk through, and I try to set the expectation of when you walk through, I want you to look at stuff that cannot be changed. Location, structures, um, the big ticket items. If it's paint, color of walls, uh, furniture, pictures on the walls, I need you to understand to look past that. We want to envision you, you living in the house, and the way they put their furniture might not be the way you do it. Um, things like carpet, things like paint, cosmetic, tile, those things can be changed. I can't change location. I can't change view. I can't change in school districts. Those sort of things are big, big ticket items. Um, so I, you know, you try to set a level of expectation of like, you know, don't look at the things on the walls and this and that. All of that stuff can be fixed. Let's look at the big stuff. Cosmetically, we can change anything. Um, and when you walk into it, you're going to get a feeling. You're going to know based on what I show you if it's a one to ten. If they're telling you it's an eight or nine, you are putting a big asterisk on that, and that's going to be your go-to property that you're leaning on when you talk to your client. You're pushing on, great, it was an eight, why not a 10? Oh my God, the kitchen was horrendous, I hated the tile. Awesome, so if we were able to get a repair credit, or if we got it at the right price, that you were able to do some rehabbing on the kitchen, this would be a candidate. Great, let's write on this one. Let's make that a condition of our offer. Let's talk about that on how we can, we can make this happen. So a new kitchen countertop, maybe $6,000. So if we were able to get a reduction of six to $10,000 on that price, that can leave some money in your pocket. Or uh, you know, we could start figuring out how we can structure this. But if you're an eight or above, you should be riding on that property. Let's see what we can make on this property. Um, if they're a yeah, yeah let me to come in and tell, tell a story. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's real important to understand the showing instructions on the matrix. Follow those showing instructions. I just uh, heard some information about an agent who was driving through the neighborhood. His client said, "Oh, there's a house I love it," and uh, the lock there was a lockbox on it. He didn't read the showing instructions, which meant which was called the listing agent making the appointment. So he opens up the lockbox. So he probably knocked on it, but nobody answered. Opened up the lockbox, took the key, he and his client went inside, two story house, showed him downstairs, went upstairs, 16 year old daughter up there taking a the shower. Oh, that geez. agent is now before the professional standard. Oh. So remember oh. that. Just remember that. You don't want to be in that type of situation. Always wow. announce yourself when you, when you enter the house. I had two when I was taking my clients around, the one that we're in escrow right now. Um, they would, a lot of times, the wife would have Zillow up. Uh, and stuff would come on the market as we're looking at things, and she would want to go to them. Yeah. And so every time I would say, okay, let me pull it up on my phone and double check that it's vacant, and then we can go. And yeah. if we can't, then I would just say, we can shoot for Monday next week, but uh, like it's occupied. We can't, but I always would pull it up and check it You need to stand firm with your client that says, because they're like, oh, there's a property right there. Let's go look at it. Wonderful. Let me, even if you can't get it on your phone, reach out to the listing agent. If you can't get approval or an understanding of what those showing instructions are, you need to tell your client, unfortunately, we, I would hate to walk in and we walk in on something. So we really need to be clear um, before we go show that property. But I have it down on the list. Um, you know, maybe we, by the end of this showing, I'll have an answer back on whether we can go or when we get back in front of a computer or while I'm doing this, I could be looking it up. But 
don't think you're going to lose a client because if you don't show them the property, you, you are better off by doing sticking with protocol and explaining to them why you can't. Not you're not willing to show it or you're not capable of getting the information. It's unfortunately, it's so new on the market or it just came on Zillow, the showing instructions aren't up yet. Um, and it's not listed in my information and therefore, you know, let me do some research on the property before I just open it up to you. Is that fair? No one is going to typically argue with that. And they're going to respect the fact that you know your protocol. Um, you walk up to the house, you're knocking first. What do you do with the key? He's so, at the door. Everybody has some sort of protocol. I leave mine on the door. Some people put them back in the lockbox. Do not put it in your pocket. I have too many times experienced agents putting it in their pocket and then they lock the door behind them and they leave by locking just the deadbolt and they walk out and they go to the next house and they went, <laughs> shoot. And now I don't know, and they might have multiple keys in there and I don't know who goes to where. Um, don't put it on the countertop. You may find yourself locking yourself out of the house. Ultimately, I think the best bet, what I do, I, I either put it in the door and I turn it because if the door slams shut, the key won't come out of the lock or I actually put it back in the lockbox and I lock it. But one or two of those options, I haven't had an issue with yet. Um, but get yourself into a habit that's safe because when you start showing 30, 40 homes, things start blending together. Homes will blend together. You literally will lose track of what you just showed. People will be like, what do you think of that house yesterday? And you'll go, oh, it was freaking great. You know, what else are we talking about? I've looked at 15 houses since yesterday with multiple other clients, but I have to play it off and I know exactly what you're talking about because your house is the most important thing in my world right now with 15 other people. Yeah. So be cautious about that. Make yourself notes as well. So you knock on the door, no one comes. Do not knock on the door and then open the door. Give somebody a chance to come down. And even if the showing instruction says occupied and you've gotten approval to be there at one o'clock, you are not just gonna go walking right in. You're gonna knock on the door, you're gonna wait, knock on the door again, then you unlock and open the door. And before you even let your client say, you are in front. Open the door, knock again, Hubble Real Estate, hello. And you're going to announce yourself really, really loud, and then you're going to pause and wait. Okay, nothing. And say, yeah, I've heard horror stories. Come on in. Welcome <laughs> home. Um, just come on in, and you're going to have your MLS sheet with you, and this is where you'll start spouting out some. So welcome home. This property is a three-bedroom, two-bath. It's about 2,400 square feet, and the average days on market, it's been on the market for about 32 days right now. Let's go ahead and uh, feel free to walk around. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Give them some space, but don't let them wander. Don't let them split. Don't let the husband go upstairs and the wife go downstairs. If you see that a pattern with that, with that buyer, then take control and actually walk them through the house. Because again, you don't want them to one party go up there, keep you occupied while the other one's going through jewelry or medicine cabinets or whatever, and all of a sudden there is a potential issue. You're gonna know your client, but if this is the first showing and you, this is general public, um, and you're going to be a little cautious and you need to be, that needs to be in the back of your mind. You know, it's your, this is your responsibility to protect this home while they're there. Um, if you've never met with clients before and this is your first property and you're going to a remote area, um, we always use the buddy system where I'll tell my dad, hey, I'm going to ABC property first. I'm just doing a quick little timeline. I'll shoot a quick email out to somebody, one of my buddies just to let them know these are the properties I'm looking at, especially if it's the first general public that I just don't know about. Um, if I really am going to a remote area or just something, I'll shoot my dad a picture of the, of the license plate, of the person's license plate that is parked in front of me. And I do it really just on the slide, just shoot it off as a text message. Um, you start showing in Paso Robles or out off of 46 or acreage, or you go up to, uh, I mean, you're showing land and it's like 26 acres out in the middle of nowhere. I would definitely be telling people <laughs> where you're going, who you're going to be with. Uh, you might actually want to have an interview up front to make sure. Um, but that's kind of in our protocol as far as how to show property. Like, 
you know, let someone know what you're doing. Once you're on, once you've shown it once and you gotta, you know, go with your gut, then you know, like, all right, do I need to be so cautious? I, you know, like, I kind of know these people, or we have mutual friends, or like they're in the community. You, you, know, you kind of let your guard down at that point. Um, all right, so you accompany people around the house. If you want to really do a good job, if you're just showing one property, like it's a second showing, you're going to get there early and you're going to turn all the lights on. If you're just running through where you're still in the rapport stage and you're kind of out here where you don't know what they're looking for yet, because it's going to start out here, you're going to show a lot of property, then it's going to come down to here where I like five of these properties and it's going to come down to here where it's between one or two. The one or two, you want to do something special. You want to get there early, turn the lights on, um, talk to the seller and be like, hey, you know, if you want to light a candle or something, like make it, put some mu music on, some mood, mood music, really accent the amenities in the house. Because now at that point, the client is looking at things like in detail. When you're out here, they're running through properties in 15 minutes. They're not looking at the fine detail. A second showing, you have a potential offer coming down the pipeline. So the devil's going to be in the detail on how you show it. Um, uh, point out only features that are not obvious. So if you go, uh, yes, it's a two-story house, and you're standing in front of the stairs. You're going to sound. You're going to sound. No. <laughs> uh, there's carpet and tile in the kitchen. No. Stay away from that. Uh, house was built, and this year. Um, it doesn't look like they've had any major remodels in the house. That's more of an educated comment. Um, the only part of this house that has been remodeled has been this. When you're on the phone, I know I'm kind of jumping back and forth, and I'm not really following this, because working with buyers is almost a pattern. When you're on the phone setting up the appointment with the agent, that's a qualifying question, so tell me about the house. Is there anything I should know about the house? What are the highlights? How would you price it? Why would you price it that way? Why are the sellers moving? Why are the sellers moving? You're making notes like that because those are the comments that you want to be making when you're showing the house. Not, oh, look at the, you know, it's tile here and carpet here. It's, so the sellers are moving because they got a job, a relocation, and they need to move in the next 60 days. Um, they priced it accordingly because there's two comps down the street that have sold just last month. Um, there is some flexibility. The sellers are motivated to sell, but they're not willing to give the house away. It basically, that statement right there is saying, we can negotiate, but don't bother lowballing. You know, it's, it's a nice way of saying that. Um, uh, I've worked with the agent in the past, very educated agent. Um, you know, th this would be something that, uh, um, you know, if you know that they're a local agent and they've been around for a while, reputation means a lot. If you're like, oh yeah, um, I don't recognize the agent. But they're very with a reputable company in the area. Um, I don't know why that would matter. Ultimately, if you have some really, um, <sighs> watch what I say here. Just because if you have, if the agent has a reputation of um, this is how they operate, you know, they get you under a contract. They don't negotiate requests for repairs. Um, you can set that expectation as far as this is how I handled this agent. I've worked with an agent like this in the past. They don't do a lot of requests for repairs. So if this became something that we want to move on, we might need to re do negotiate strong in the beginning than in the middle of the escrow. Um, you know, you're just take that's your personal experience on working in this industry. Um, that will come with time, but stick with the house. At that. Stick with the house. Ultimately, that's all that matters. The agent's experience, and then the sellers are making a decision, not the agent. So you're, you're definitely taking it to the next level if you start talking like that. Um, where else am I? Oh, a couple. If, if, if it looks like you're not going to make the appointment, be sure and call the agent and cancel. So many times I, I had that, uh, that triplex. So I had to get with each of the tenants, set up an appointment, and the guy doesn't show up. Yes, that's no, just frustrating. It's not professional, so don't don't be that yeah, right. Don't do that. We are striving to have an excellent reputation, and it's the little stuff that matters. So again, you show the property, it takes 30 seconds to shoot the text message out. But right there, sign your name on the bottom of the text message also. Because they may have had multiple showings that day and they need to know who you are. Another thing annoying for the listing agent is for the listing agent to get a call from their client saying, 
the back slider was open, the mm -hmm. lights were on. So yeah. don't so know we're that. Getting, we're getting there. The lights off, make sure everything's locked. Um, well, the rule is leave it the way you found it because it's like if they left the back door right. unlocked so that they yeah. can get in, don't lock it. Right. And again, don't show don't show a, a listing if there's an agent already inside the, the property. Yeah. Don't take yeah. your client yeah. in there. Wait outside till they're completed. I had a I had a question on that one. I had um or if we got time. Yeah. Oh. Um I had I took clients over to this house that came back on the market. When we went to go in there, there was another agent in there. So I told him I saw a door open. I said, hang on one sec. I'll be right back. And I went in just to make sure. And I said, okay, there's another agent in there with clients. Let's let them walk through and we'll wait out front. And then we'll go in after they're done. Um, as we're waiting, another agent came with clients okay. and just walked right in and started showing them the whole house. And then it was like, well, do we just sit here and wait? Or So I told them, I go, well, if everyone's going in walking through the house, I mean, um, it's I would have stopped with that. There, yeah. there, there was there was multiple. Yeah. Actually, we're next. We're gonna be showing next. Show it for you. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. Yeah. Hey. 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 Uh, oh, yeah. It's a professional courtesy. You can. I wouldn't do it. I would not do that in front of people. I pull the agent to the side and say, "Hey, we're actually next. Um, you know, can you hold your clients back? We're going to take ten minutes, and then we have our showing instructions. If you call them out in the front, it's going to end up being a, a debate right there, and it, you know, you're basically calling them out at being unprofessional. Well, so how, 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 you them, how do you get them to the side, though? I mean, cause like uh, it's professional time. courtesy. So if they don't do it. They don't. And you That's can ultimately cool. take that information and pass that on to the same. Yeah, you know, we, we, we'd appreciate to have that. Um, the other agents just blew, us, blew that off. Like, I, I, I know. When you do that, that's how you build a poor reputation. Yes. Because it's going to stick in your book. You introduce yourself to the agent and say, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah. Okay. Very politely. Can I talk mm -hmm. to you for a moment? When you get there and they're showing there's someone in there, you keep your clients outside, but you walk in. Hi, I'm Noah. I just want to let you know I'm the next agent in line to show the property. We're going to be outside. Our appointment's at 1.15. Um, just, just wanted to let you know. We'll yeah, I had gone in and I talked to that agent. I said, hey, I'll just let you know I have some clients out front. We'll wait till you guys are done and then we'll go through. Okay. And um, then the other, other agent showed up with a couple of people and just walked right, right in and wow. just started showing everyone. <laughs> well, the weird thing was when we were there, I overheard her saying, um, she goes, oh yeah, I usually do this one agent at a time. It's weird that everyone's in here. I'm going, you're the whole reason everybody's <laughs> in here because you just ran in with your clients and now there's, you know, like four parties that are walking through the house. Yeah. Luckily it was like two lot, two house things. So there's Again, this is one of those go with the flow type things. As long as your client knows that, yes, I try to keep a level of professionalism. It's, it's, it's an unspoken professional courtesy. But there is no ethics violation, I and mean, there's nothing to do. I did it. let them know, and I let the first agent that was in there know. I was like, "Hey, I don't." Uh, we were waiting out front, like because I had told her when I first got there. Stand the ground, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, you be the professional. You be the professional. We we are raising the bar. Um, have an offer in your car, so you should always have a listing agreement, a blank listing agreement, and blank offers in your car at all times. Because you never know when someone's like, this is it. I don't have time to go back to the office. Let's write this thing right now. It's like, you better be ready to go right there. If you're not ready, your response is, wonderful. Let me get down some information. I'll go back and write it up, and I will email you for signatures. That will buy you some time. <laughs> that will buy you time. Work, <laughs> well, that works. Um, feedback's a big deal. Um, Okay, so now you walk in the property, um, kind of like what Linda said, come across the door that's unlocked. I'd actually take it to the next level and say, I'd call the listing agent or text them and say, hey, there was a back door that was unlocked. Would you like me to lock it or, un or keep it unlocked? And they go, maybe even a nice little, a text message might be better just because now you have it in writing because ultimately if the house got broken into, guess what? You're the last person there. Who do you think the fingers are going to be pointed to if the TV is missing? You, <laughs> all day long, you know it's going to get kicked in. 
something got stolen that was worth thousands of dollars of a new laptop, all of a sudden everything escalates and we get new TVs, new computers, um, you know, the master bedroom bed bed oh, set is missing. Yeah. yeah, like and there's damage in the house and yada yada yada. It doesn't even have to be high value. Uh, I had somebody call and say that beer was missing from this fridge. A beer. Uh, it's these, beer. No joke. So if you're the last person that touches anything, you're on the hook. And you better have a CYA to show I, I you know, I was there. Because ultimately what would happen is you would get pulled in, your clients would get pulled in, and the testimonials will start happening. The, the, what do they call? Um, depositions. depositions. Thank you. This is what happened when I was there. And then they have to review the deposition to find out if there's any flaw in what you're saying. And if they find fault, you're on the hook. $2,500 E&O liability. There you go. Yay. That show and cost $2,500. Uh, so you come across an unlocked door. I'm taking the next. Ultimately, the, the Kirk concept's exactly it. You leave the house the way you found it, make sure lights are off, um, and you are the last one to leave the house. If your client asks to use the restroom, protocol is no. Like, no. Ask if you need to use the restroom before you start leaving. Um, if they do and they forgot to ask you, follow up through the bathroom after they're gone, not make it awkward, like, hey, I'm standing by the door, they come down, <laughs> the toilet's still filling up with water, you go walk in and instead of, like, cleaning up. You know, let them leave, and this is part of your closing out pack, like, closing out the house. Make sure the toilet seat is down. Um, the goal is no. So, um, yeah, excuse me, David. If the yeah. lights are on when you get there, do you leave all the lights on? Um, Again, that's the agent showing up prior to the showing, setting that all up. A quick text that says, uh, you know, these are things that you leave it like you, you found it. But a courtesy text, especially if you're in contact with the agent, would you like me to turn the lights off for you? It, there's an important point that you just rolled over, but it. Uh, I'll keep my eye on. No, never talk about the price in front of the seller. Don't talk negative about the property. When this happened to me when yeah. I first started. And we were a caravan, and my clients are there. And we're walking through there, there's probably 15 people in there, and then seasoned agent standing right next to my client says, Oh my gosh, she's got this price really low. Well, it's gonna go quick. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that just makes him look incompetent, that he's just trying to sell a property quickly. Everybody has their own opinion. Keep it to yourself. Yeah. Um, also with technology nowadays, um, cameras are a big thing. Having cameras in living rooms, they're 35 bucks. Like you can throw up a camera and have a network going on in your house. Do not talk negotiating strategy inside the house. Never. I mean, I can't tell. I, I, I've been on the listing side of it where my client goes, oh, I got a video of all the showings. And I went, well, how'd it go? <laughs> so do not talk negotiating strategies. Technology is too easy nowadays to have a camera up and boom, especially smart homes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's part of the doorbell will have a camera on it and a microphone. And a microphone. <laughs> they could actually, the seller could actually talk back. Like I was showing the house and Mark goes, oh, well, the, oh, <laughs> like uh, oh, the HOAs are actually 137, babe, oh, oh, not God. 145. No. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Oh, now all the buyers in the living room are like, what's that? Oh, this is a smart house. Like, that's the seller. That's the stock or seller. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so be cautious nice about that. Day. Wait till you're either at the office or back in the car. But prep your client yeah, too. Like, like, hey, when we show these properties, uh, when we show these properties, I want you to write it down. I want you to write your comments down. Because I don't know, ultimately, if they walk through and they're like, oh my God, I love this house, David. I love this house. We, we need to make this house our home. What do I need to do? That just made my job very difficult if the buyer gets that information. So, um, David, this house is a piece of junk. Uh, <laughs> da, 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 da. And then the agent calls me and it's like, you know, the, the agent calls and says, man, your clients were just jerks. And, you know, what, yada, yada, yada. And that just, puts a bad light in, to me with that agent also. So I just prep them right out of the gate, don't do that. Um, 
don't be excessive in your praise about the property. It's fine to be like, oh, it's nice. But that's that's what I mean when I say, oh my God, I love this property. Oh my God, the colors are beautiful. I can see my our kitchen family, like our kitchen <laughs> table can fit here in our living room furniture. This is our dream house. Like you just are paying full price. Like, um, okay, think safety. So certain properties you're gonna walk into and you're gonna find that there's walls missing, uh, furniture is missing, there's electrical outlets. If it talks about a distressed home or a great for a remodel or great for a contractor special, you better have in the back of your mind there might be some health and safety issues going on in this property. And so let's be cautious. Um, you know, I listed a property three months ago that literally had no inside of the house. Um, there were holes in the ground. And so I thought as a listing agent, I should probably tape this thing off after I started getting some feedback from agents. <laughs> Why don't we tape it off from the front door where they can just poke their head in? Because you can look through the whole house because there were no walls up. <laughs> so you, it was just framing. Um, that was a probably a good decision as a listing agent to make that judgment call. Um, for health and safety issues. Um, okay, you're working with buyer. They found the house. They love the house. What am I doing on time? Okay, let's get into the negotiation of the offer. So now you're ready to start working on an offer with the buyer. Um, you need to set an expectation up front. How do you want to negotiate this offer? Do we want to negotiate hard right now? Or do we want to negotiate fair? get our inspections, and then renegotiate based on the information we find. So typically I try to do the fair way of going visually what we can see, that's the house. You're buying what you can see. So we know that it's an older model house, 1980s. So yes, the inspection report is gonna come back with caulking around the sink, it needs to be redone. That's not a deal breaker. So we're negotiating big ticket items right now. We can see that the roof is distressed. We can see that there's a deck that's distressed. If we are planning on asking for money for repairs or a price reduction, let's do it now. The little minor stuff you typically can get away with. Um, I'm starting to find in this market, if you set the expectation high of let's just get the offer and then I can renegotiate a big number in contract, that, tip, that is not actually happening anymore. I'm starting to get a lot of pushback on that negotiation. It's starting to become a norm. And so sellers are getting prepped for it. They're getting aware of it. Agents are aware of that, that negotiating tactic. And so it pretty much is a dead deal because sellers are getting onto that, that tactic. It's almost better now to negotiate hard up front than try to negotiate hard in the middle of it. I'm getting more canceled deals when going that direction. So um, again, it's, it's strategy. It's up to you guys on how you want to run with it. Little items, a couple grand, um, fix it items, water heaters, strappings, uh, electrical outlets, health and safety, like actual stuff that you find out in the inspection that was an unknown. Those all day long, that's why you have the request for repair to negotiate that. But to think that I see that the roof is damaged, let's give them what they want, full price. Let's wrap them up 21 days. And then let's beat the heck out of them up over that roof and try to get $30,000 off the asking price. You might as well just go find another property. That strategy is not working anymore. There's enough buyers that will offer what they want. There's enough buyers that will be truthful up front of what their intentions are. It's actually a borderline ethics violation as far as what's a good faith considered. Hard to ever prove, so you're never going to get in trouble for it. But as you start building a reputation, if you constantly have negotiations like that, you will have a reputation of, he just ties people up in contract. Especially if the offer is very blunt, like over the top, perfect offer. People are gonna read through that. I've been on the market for 70 days and I get a full price, no negotiation offer when there's <laughs> obvious repairs that need to be addressed, you're, you're gonna get called out. Um, or you're just gonna get called out where they're gonna tighten it. The agents can be very upfront with you. Don't think you're going to come to me in 21 days and negotiate. Might as well just send me a cancellation instead. And that was exactly the negotiation we just had on another deal. And I've been seeing that more and more and more. So um, very common for 30 day escrows. If you're a cash deal, there's no reason why you can't give a shorter escrow. The quickest escrow I've ever done is five days. Um, 
but everything was all done prior, like prelim was pulled, the listing agent, myself, had a lot of stuff done, and so the cash person came in, released contingencies at the moment we got an acceptance, there was nothing to do other than just get the money to escrow and transfer the deed. Um, if you have a cash deal, 21 days, 20 days, like you can pull that off very easily. You can get them to do their inspections. Um, you know, there's no appraisal, so it really comes down to if it's a cash deal, when does the buyer feel comfortable in buying this property? So how long is it gonna take? Based on showing the property and the conversations you've had, what type of inspections are you setting up for yourself? If it's a typical home inspection, the house looks pretty clean, then that can be done in the first week to 10 days. If it looks like you need a roofer and a septic and all of this, that's gonna take a little bit longer. Um, so keep that in mind. A loan, 30 days. Your protection is always gonna be that you have your contingency period. Okay, make sure that when you're writing an offer, if your buyers are like, how do I protect my deposit? It's that contingency period. Never sign a contingency release unless your buyers are 100% I'm committed to buying this property. I don't care if your contingencies are due, you make sure you have that conversation with the buyer that says, are you sure that you are comfortable buying this house? The moment you sign this document, there's no coming back. You will lose your money. I have zero recourse if they sign the contingency release. There's very little things that I can do as a broker to get their money back unless there was some material fact that wasn't disclosed to us after the fact. That's really one of the only things that I can argue to hold up a dispute about getting money back. So if they signed it and then all of a sudden they, they lost their job, their loan fell through, and they go, well, my loan fell through because the sellers um, did something back in the day that delayed us. Well, so what? You released your loan contingencies, which means at that moment in time, you were comfortable with your loan. So anything from there on out is on us, which ultimately means the, the lender works for us and he didn't perform, it's our fault. If he didn't hit the close date, it's our fault. There is zero recourse at that point. Uh, okay, uh, before we close it out, is there anything that wanted to go over that we didn't? Sorry, question for you. Yeah. Um, if you if you do something like purchasing a lot for or you know a tear down or something to see okay. and you want to know what you can build on it, okay. um, what's a good escrow period for somebody like that? If they're um, again, a lot you need to know you need to make sure you know your responsibilities versus the buyer's responsibilities. It is not your responsibility to go down to the city and do the due diligence of what you can. I mean, what, like what should you advise them? Like, what's a good how quick are they ready to respond? And you can get all those answers done in the 21 day contingency period. There's no reason why you can't get that done in 30 days. But maybe they're out of town, they're not going to be back for two weeks. You know. I was talking about the escrow period. And it's like when I had my lawn, it was like it was okay to do a 60 day escrow because the yes. guy has to figure out what he wants to build, how he's going to build it. It says like, there is no direct answer for that. It's your client kind of what they're trying to do. The agent and stuff. Yes. Okay. If it's a total like we're trying to build, then your justification is there for a longer escrow period. Hey, we're doing a 1031 and we need to identify a property and then it needs to transfer and we're just in the process of selling. I mean, there's so many different scenarios, but it's, it comes down to your client. If you're working with a client like that, setting the expectation up front on what their responsibility is. Your goal is to coordinate and give them names, numbers, contacts, who to talk to, why to talk to them. Your job is not to talk to them for. Because your interpretation of what they tell you could be different to what their interpretation of what they're trying to find out. So even if you do that, you're still following up with, now that we're in escrow, you need to go follow up with what I'm sending you. I talked to the builder, this is what he gave me, and you need to have it documented in writing as an email. Hey, this is what the builder, this is what the city gave me. I talked to this person. Go ahead and follow up with them with any questions or answers. That's their job to, to walk you through that process. Like they, they would be the source to talk to. You know, that's you, again, CYA, getting yourself off the hook. You are not the planning department. So don't, you can't be that person. I get you, I was just asking about the escrow period. Um, Winnet, Red, you guys got anything? I'm muted. Do you muted? No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. 
when I, you got any questions about showing property or anything that you've come up with with a, a dispute or a problem? No. 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 Yeah. Good. Let's go show some property. Let's go get it. Oh, last thing. Make sure your key card is updated. It is the most embarrassing thing when you walk to a property and your key card is expired. That's what the app is yeah, for. That's, that's what the app is for. If yeah. that happens, you can call the 1-800 number on the back of your key card and you get two over the phone renewals and they're good for 24 hours. Yeah, so the moment 24 hours lapses. Dave. Yeah, Dave. I also carry with my laptop a key card upgrade so I can plug it into my computer and upgrade it wherever I am. Again, if you have a hot spot. I think they're like 10 bucks on online to order one. Uh, it would be smart to have one at your house. You gotta have it, it's a little card thing, card reader. Um, use the app. The app is amazing because yeah. it's instant and it gives instant reports. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're driving to a property and you're like, oh, I forgot to update my card, you can instantly um, call the 1-800 number, it'll send you a text message, and when you walk up to the lockbox, it'll give you instructions on how to update your card. Basically put it in, enter the code, hit enter, and all of a sudden your card will go chirp, 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 and that means that you're ready to, to go for 24 hours. How, do, uh, how does it go? Chirp, chirp, chirp. <laughs> <laughs> all right. When uh, we come back on Thursday, you're going to pick it up with safety? I think mean, that's a real important. Yes, so when we come back on Thursday, we'll pick it up with safety. I did say we'll start the new lesson, but I think we'll finish out the week on finishing safety and the last part of the buyers. And then the start of Tuesday, we'll start lesson all over again. Um, I've been talking with Madison. As I teach Madison our systems, Madison will start teaching a class, which I don't know if I talked to you about that or not. <laughs> she will start teaching the class of what she learns. Yeah. Um, and me and her will do the class together. It'll be called systems. And it'll go over everything that we're offering um, with a question answer of like how to do it, what's going on, because ultimately she's going to be working it, and then she's going to be showing you guys what she's learning, and that will help you guys understand what we're offering as a brokerage. And also for new yeah. agents, uh, these books are available. Just talk to David. He can pick you up a book. Um, it's got some really good scripts and sample letters. All right. <laughs> awesome. Uh, it is 103. We left off at open houses, page seven, so we'll pick it up on page, into page seven. All right, Thank you. let's go get an escrow. Ooh, and if anybody doesn't know, we raised $2,500. I saw that. 25 as of now, she says the donations are still coming in. Uh, we had a little over 160 people show up. Um, we gave away a lot of food. Um, all of the auction items were sold. Some of us gave away a lot of wine. <laughs> Some of us gave away a lot of good wine. No one got in trouble with any DUIs. Um, and all of the response that I got, I think most agents had um, some clients here. Everybody's saying that they had an excellent time, a good response. I and mean, all in all, it was a great success. And those of you contributed, thank you very much. Yeah, but um, if we do things like that every quarter, I mean, just being in the community like that, that's how we get into our business. So, uh, awesome. Uh, thank you, everybody. And um, when we're done with the lessons, we should do a listing presentation uh, day where everyone takes turns, like doing the listing presentation. The listing presentation, so you can hear everyone like what you like and dislike about how people work. Um, I highly encourage everybody to get their listing presentation together and their buyer check off list together. These are things that are like you need to have a listing presentation. Hey, yeah, so if you don't have an actual listing presentation in a booklet, in a PDF, in an iPad, you're just going and winging it with a listing contract and think that rapport is what's gonna get you the listing, the industry has shifted so much that you will get beat. I mean, there's too many people that are prepared nowadays. They may be brand spanking new, but because they look prepared, they're gonna beat you every time. Even if you're the better agent with the knowledge of the neighborhood, da, 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 if you don't have a good presentation, you're like, you're not even a competitor. Yeah. So get your presentation. Ours is on the back end. It has an editable version as well. Edit away. Kevin last week had a great comment about how do I put like my education in my presentation to share with the client like all this stuff I'm learning about contracts. It's like, yes, I don't put it in my presentation because it's just part of who I am when I'm talking. 
but I would definitely want to convey that to a, to a seller that I am an educated professional agent that knows exactly how the transaction is going to play out before it even does. Um, so just one thing, um, for those that don't check their emails, we are doing templates training tomorrow morning at 9.30 here. Not just for the new agents, yeah. but some seasoned agents. So Linda's going to be hosting, like Linda, she's going to yeah. be hosting a template training for car zip forms on the benefit of setting up your zip forms correctly with templates and how you can uh, efficiently write offers a lot more quicker and a lot more quicker. But, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Thanks, Guys, thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Talk to you soon.